Welcome to Data Brew by Databricks with Denny and Brooke. The series allows us to explore various topics in the data and AI community. Whether we're talking about data engineering or data science, we're going to interview subject matter experts to dive deeper into these topics. In this season, we're going to focus on connected health and how data and AI augment and improve our daily health. And while we're at it, we're going to enjoy our morning brew. My name is Denny Lee. I'm a developer advocate here at Databricks and one half of Data Brew. And hello, everyone. My name is Brooke Wenig, machine learning practice lead at Databricks and the other half of Databrew. And today I am thrilled to introduce two of my longtime friends, Shayna Pallas and Ely Anku. Shayna Pallas is a professional cyclist on Team USA, and she races all domains of bikes from mountain bikes, gravel bikes, time trials, cyclocross, esports, you name it. Um, and Ely Anku is a nose tackle for the Buffalo Bills. Uh, and the two of them had studied together at UCLA and co founded the nonprofit, the Dreamcatcher Foundation. Welcome, Shayna and Ely. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you having us. <laughs> of course. Thank you both so much for making the time to join us. I know you're both very busy as pro athletes. Um, and I guess to kick it off, Shayna, could you talk a bit about how you got into the field of cycling? That's a great question. Um, yeah, I've pretty much been involved in cycling since around the same time I started walking. <laughs> uh, so I actually rode my first bike. I think I was probably around a year old, like a little tricycle. Then I got got off training wheels officially when I was two years old, did my first cross country mountain bike race when I was four years old. So, um, you know, I think, you know, the fact that both of my parents were triathletes, super into cycling, just very, very talented athletes themselves kind of helped inspire me to start from such, such a young age. Um, and they also inspired my brother as well, because my brother, he's a couple years younger, but kind of followed in my footsteps um, with cycling and all the other sports that we did growing up. So we did, we did pretty much everything from cycling, triathlon, swim team, basketball, volleyball, even like gymnastics. And I even did horseback riding for a couple of years when I was a teenager. So yeah, we kind of, we kind of did it all. Um, but cycling was always something that we kind of gravitated towards the most and kind of slowly over time realized that that's the sport that we excelled at the most as well. So um, I would say probably in my high school years competing in the Norca High School Mountain Bike League, be in NICA um, for my high school, um, was really like kind of the first stepping stone in me kind of reaching that professional level of cycling. Um, you know, just doing well in the, the high school league, doing well in like local races as well, really helped get my name out there, helped me develop as an athlete, um, even helped, get, helped me get my name out there with DSA Cycling. And um, that's really where it all started for me. Um, and the rest is kind of history. So I uh, continued on into college with um, competing for the UCLA cycling team, um, competed on the road and in mountain biking. And then I turned professional when I categorized out of the junior ranks when I turned 19. So pretty much since the age of 19, I've been, I've been competing professionally um, through road, mountain biking, esports. Like Brooke already said, um, I've kind of done a lot of different disciplines, even cyclocross and most recently gravel and track racing. Um, so yeah, I've, I've done it all. Um, only discipline I think I haven't done actually is BMX, but yeah, that's pretty much how it all started. <laughs> and I forgot to mention that Shayna is also a cycling coach of Palace Performance. Yes. <laughs> I've been a coach for a few years now and it's something that I love to do aside from being an athlete. So yeah, I just love it. <laughs> That's awesome. So I want to segue a little bit to Ely, though, um, because as a fellow Canadian, I'm surprised that you're, you know, you're not playing hockey or rugby, that instead you're, what got you into football instead, actually? Man, uh, so football was never really part of the plan initially. Uh, I actually used to do something called the uh, Royal Canadian Air Cadets. That's basically a little program that a lot of kids get into from the age of like 13 to about 19. And they learn a lot of like leadership skills. Uh, they learn a lot of you know military um, style exercises like survival. Um, and, and one field I really wanted to get into was being able to fly planes. Right, I got my first little ride along in a plane. You know, when I was like 13, 14, it was a glider, and I fell in love with aviation from then on. Um, obviously, you know, time goes on. You know, you got all my friends telling me you're a big kid, like you should try football, right? family, friends as well. And uh, next thing you know, man, I'm, I'm trying out for this youth football team 
called the Cumberland Panthers. And uh, yeah, I, I had a blast, man. Um, you know, that's pretty much what started off my love for the game. Um, it's not until the age of like 15 where I was really like, okay, getting in deeper into the sport and, and trying to learn as much as I could with an intent behind it. Initially, is really just playing for fun and kind of just going with the flow. But yeah, I mean, you know, pretty much an early teen kid, you know, starting the game of football just because somebody just suggested I should try it out. No, that's pretty cool. And then I, this naturally segues to the question, actually for you, for both of you, which is like many kids really do, they, they dream of becoming professional athletes, which you two are right now, which is pretty cool. But it, the chances of it are actually pretty slim. So what made you realize that you still wanted to pursue that progression anyways, knowing full well that like the idea of becoming a professional athlete is, is, is that difficult? Well, I'll, I'll keep it real with you, man. Uh, <laughs> so early on, I, I, had a, I had quite a few coaches tell me, you know, you should probably aim for a little less lofty goals. You should try and aim for something a little more realistic. And, you know, it, it's, it's kind of one of those things you don't want to put into the mind uh, of a kid, like a teenager, because, or, you know, like a, a younger child, because it limits their, their, their thoughts on what they can achieve, right? And that could be for sports, and that could be for literally anything else. You have all these people out in the world who are doing great things. And I, I just saw you guys mentioned uh, data and AI, and there's so many people in that field that are, like, doing amazing things. I've been keeping up with that um, as of late. But, you know, for me, uh, I think it's important for kids to have the encouragement from an early age and the reaffirmation that they do have the ability to, to achieve, you know, what they want. In terms of becoming a pro athlete, you know, a lot of times um, kids look at the, the pro athlete and they figure, well, you know, they kind of just got there. You know, it's just that's who they are. That's who they are now. But they don't realize that there's a whole story behind that. They don't realize that, you know, athletes like myself or Shayna, you know, it took thousands of hours of just refining your craft, getting better at what you're doing. And it took a lot of effort. And I think that's something that needs to be, um, I guess, reinforced is, is repetition and being able to realize that, you know, you're not quite at your ceiling, uh, you know, at a certain point, you just keep on pushing your limits and see where you can go with it. So at least that's for me. I don't know. Yeah. And, um, for me, like, I think it, like a huge impact on me ever since I was young was really just ha like being surrounded by, you know, super supportive and encouraging people such as my parents, um, other family members, um, my brother, you know, I definitely wouldn't be where I'm at today if it wasn't for, you know, the support system that I had growing up and all the encouragement and support I received from my parents. Um, I can't even, it's, it's hard to even begin to explain, you know, the amount of um, time and effort my parents put into supporting my brother and I, no matter if it was cycling or any sport we wanted to do, even outside of sports, like when it came to extracurriculars, like when we were doing like singing lessons, acting lessons, you know, we, we did a lot as kids and it, if it wasn't for our parents, I don't think we would, we would have been involved in as much as we were. Um, so looking at that, looking back, we were super blessed and yeah, I don't think we would be where we're at today in our professional careers if it wasn't for that amazing support system along the way. Yeah. And I think a lot of what both of you had just mentioned be applicable to any passion that somebody has pursuing, like having a support system and having goals and not trying to let other people tell you to not reach for those goals or reach for your ceiling. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. So to this day, like I always, I always say my parents, I mean, Ely too, of course, are n my number one support people. Um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't be where I'm at today without those people. So I know a lot of professional athletes, they're also very data driven. In addition to all the amazing support network, you also use data to help get to the next level of your game. Um, and so I'm curious from both the cycling and the football perspective, what kind of data do you use to help you get to that next level? Like, what do you track, uh, Shana, if you want to go first? Yeah. So I would say cycling is a very data driven sport. I mean, all the metrics we use in cycling to measure, you know, our efforts, um, power output, heart rate, um, like it all, we all put it together just to, you know, track performance, track gains that we're making along the way. Um, for me personally, and I know a lot of other athletes and professionals use Training Peaks, which is basically an online site where you can upload all your cycling data from your computer that you use in training, racing, etc. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, I also use a power meter and I know a lot of other cyclists do as well. Um, though when I first started out, I didn't use any of that. I didn't use heart rate. I didn't use a power meter. I just went out, rode my bike and had fun. Um, and everything was just kind of measured off of like perceived output. But now that I'm more developed, um, now that I'm racing professionally, it's, I think it's very important to be able to use, um, just hard data from like a power meter heart rate, not so much, but I think it is still important to look at just, you know, heart rate variability to kind of just track your, your recovery and where you're at, um, with your training. Um, but yeah, mostly I would say I base my training and, um, gains off of power. So I have like certain zones that I base training off of zones, like one through five. Um, and each zone has like a certain power window, which is called uh, it's basically power watts. And so that's pretty much everything that I base my training off of. My co my personal coach uses that as well to give me my personal training. That's also what I use for most of my athletes who do have access to a power meter. Um, although I do work with some people who just use heart rate and that's fine too. But at the same time, I would say heart rate tends to be a little bit more subjective um, and can be more influenced by a lot of outside factors such as stress, temperature, um, et cetera, things like that. Whereas power is power. It's much more direct, um, more accurate, I guess you could say. Um, so yeah, that's what I personally use, um, and prefer the most, but yeah, again, cycling is a very, <laughs> very much data driven. Um, I'm rarely not looking down at my computer to track where I am with my Watts and how hard I'm pushing. Um, usually I don't, pay attention to that if I'm like going really hard in a race. Um, although I do tend to look at it if it's a time trial, just because I think that's important just so I can track and make sure that I'm not going out too fast or too hard. So yeah, that's what I tend to use. <laughs> I, I think that, um, you know, I guess the more we think about these things, the more we talk about it, the more you realize that everything around us is driven by data. Right. And, yeah, I guess in the sport of football, every pretty much most of a coach's decision is driven by data. Um, we, I mean, we have whole departments in a professional team, at least, and college teams that are purely dedicated to collecting data on ourselves or on the opponent, right? You want to find out what they're going to do on third down on the 12-yard line and in. You're going to want to find out what they do in the red zone. You're going to want to find out their tendencies when the running back, you know, shifts out out of the formation. Like there's so many different, um, um, you know, values or, or, or actions that can be quantified on some level. And that drives a lot of what I do, right? In comparison to all the numbers that I would generally see up on a board or on a spreadsheet, my job is pretty simple as a football player. And that's create disruption, get in the backfield, get to the quarterback, get to the running back, you know, obviously create separation, but that's the final action that I do. Those actions are driven by the data that was given to me by my coaches who are in turn getting theirs off of, you know, the, the analytics guys. Um, so again, right. Um, just an example. I don't know if anyone is, is uh, brushed up on their, their football knowledge, but third down, you know, in the, the world of football is known as like, you know, third and long is known as a passing down. And that's something very important for a lot of people to know, especially if you're on the defensive line. You know, maybe you're going to make a specific decision to get in a more <clears throat> pass ready stance. And that means getting myself ready to just go straight up field and get to the quarterback rather than uh, anticipate some sort of a run play. And again, this is a very simplistic um, example, but. You know, for me as a pro athlete, you know, a lot of what I do is um, governed by the data that I'm given. And that's something that, you know, a lot of people end up having. Once you get to college, once you get to the pros, I mean, you're spending most of your hours at work um, in the film room, whether that's uh, studying your opponent, studying yourself, how you move, or again, their uh, analytics. So... It is a very crucial part of the sport at this point, you know, maybe back in the day, it was a little bit more uh, analog. It was a little bit more, you know, I'm talking the old, old days, you know, leather helmet type football, maybe a little bit different, but in this day and age where everything is so digitized and readily available for someone to watch, you know, it's a very data driven sport, you know, pretty much like 
a lot of things in the world now. No, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the things that even though you, you're talking about very different things, like in terms of you're talking about the third down and Sheena, you're talking about like the power watch, which actually I need to catch up on, by the way, since I'm still I'm still on Strava. So and basically using heart rate. Um, how, how do you balance the potential information overload? Right. Versus actually trying to actually decipher the nuggets of actual actionable information that you're trying to work with. Like, for example, Shina, you specifically talked about like, like because there's the predilection for heart rate, that's why you're working with power or watts. And, or in your case, Ely, like the fact that like, you know, in the case for the third down, right? It's okay. How do I decipher that in this case, it actually is like, you know, going to be a passing play versus, okay, no, they're going to try to trick us and make it a running play. Like how do you balance that? What it, invariably is an information overload. So, I know that in the sport of football, um, it's it's a balance, right? You don't want to be too driven by numbers, but you want to be able to use them as a tool, right? At the end of the day, it's a tool, just like a hammer would be to a nail to a construction worker. Um, you don't want the data to be the sole driver of what you do. So again, at me as a football player, I still have a level of individuality or a level of uh, instinct that comes into play, you know, that I have to in a split second, recognize what I'm seeing in terms of data and be able to react instinctively. So again, um, you know, if I see that it is third and long, but I notice that um, the lineman's hand in front of me is a little bit pale and I know he's a little bit heavy in his stance, that tells my brain, okay, they might be running the ball here or there might be some sort of like, you know, something different other than, you know, um, five step drop straight to or seven step drop to a long pass or, you know, something like that. So there's more variables other than just the data. That's just a tool. Um, ultimately, you see more down on the fields and you see the, the I, go, I guess, micro expressions that your opponent might make and that could shift your decision. Um, and again, there's so many tricks of the trade, you know, older players, they gain more knowledge of this. And, you know, you can see a lot of players who have had success you know, looking at things like this. I mean, you look at Aaron Donald, you look at, you know, guys like JJ Watt, and we call those uh, business decisions. I mean, as a football player, you see something that's like, you know, it looks pretty good. Just saying, man, sometimes you got to take that shot and, and see where it takes you, you know? Um, so that's just my thought. Yeah, and I think with cycling, um, Again, like it is a very data-driven sport, but at the same time, like that's not always everything. And sometimes data, the data can be overwhelming. Um, so there's always gonna be days where you have bad days on the bike and you just cannot keep the target power that your workout is calling for, right? So I have days like that pretty often, um, everyone does and it's days like that where I just, I just don't even really look at the power and the data as much. I just kind of go more off of feel. Um, and I guess racing would also be another example. Like how I said earlier, I don't even look at my data. I never look down at my computer when I'm racing unless it's like in a time trial. I also know people who do time trials and they don't even look at their computer at all. They just go purely off of feel. And I have actually done that before. I would say I'm personally more of a rider who kind of loves to look down and like kind of see where I'm at with my power during a time trial. But any race outside of time trialing for me personally, I do not like to look at my data. I don't look at my power. I just look at it after the race when everything's said and done. And even if my, I've had days where my power hasn't been that great and I've still somehow performed well. Um, so sometimes it's just better to just not even really look at the power. That's refreshing to hear that you have those days, Shayna, because I definitely have a lot of those days um, where whether it's trying to hit target power or target time to get up a climb, et cetera. Um, but question for you, Ely. So I know you watch a lot of game tape of both your opponents and yourself. What, is it uncomfortable watching film of yourself? Because I know I have a hard time watching back recordings of myself giving a talk or something. I'm just curious, how do you feel watching recordings of yourself playing football? Honestly speaking, it's one of those emotional roller coasters. If you watch yourself make a mistake you should have never made, it is the worst feeling. And you're like, I knew I should have done that. Like, this is terrible. Like, I don't want to deal with this. But that's the beauty of it. And that's, that's, what, that's what makes someone improve is having to deal with 
looking at your mistakes, evaluating where you went wrong, and then improving upon it, you know, later on. I will say, you know, the competitor in me, when I see myself make a really good play, I'm like, man, I got to replay this play again, you know, watch it again. You know, it's, it's, it's for sure a good feeling. Um, I, I wouldn't use the word uncomfortable. I, I remember early on when I used to watch myself play, I, you know, this, I'm talking like teenage days again, I did feel uncomfortable, but that's just teen angst. You know, you kind of, you just feel weird. You hear yourself talk, your voice is cracking. You see yourself move. You're a little bit uncoordinated compared to, you know, obviously myself today. So, um, again, yeah, I, I wouldn't use the word uncomfortable. I would just say my emotions on what I'm looking at definitely vary, but I can't let that distract from my goal in watching myself in the first place. And that's to get better at what I do. And just to reiterate what he was saying, like I had my own personal experience just over the last, actually just this past weekend of watching myself during a race and seeing a mistake that I made. We were doing the Joe Martin stage race and it was the last day this past Sunday um, and the crit coming out of the last corner. And I, there was a moment of slight hesitation and I was giving my teammate a lead out. It was just three of us, me and my teammate on my wheel and then another girl from DNA um, on her wheel who I knew that they were going to end up sprinting it out, um, but my lead out was a little bit shorter than than I had hoped for, um, just because I hesitated slightly, and so she had to go early. And then, um, for me, like looking back on that video and knowing that it was live stream, everyone could see what happened. It was a great lead out, but me personally, I know I could have done better. Um, so yeah, I did feel a little bit of guilt over that. She ended up. It was so close at the end she ended up just getting edged out by the other girl um so i can't say i blame all the i can't place all the blame on myself but at the same time looking back i'm like man who knows what the outcome could have been if i had just given it a little bit extra and not hesitated at the very end but you know that's how you learn you know going back viewing yourself making mistakes that's really just how you ultimately learn. A hundred percent yeah because if you don't see the mistake that you made and learn from it you're just going to keep making it again um, so yeah, I definitely understand that emotional roller coaster because there are some moments where you're like, that was an amazing move, but then you also have to watch the move, the moments where you could improve and learn from it. Exactly. Yeah. And so question actually for both of you. Um, so I know that understanding and reading your opponents is super important. Do you do any kind of training on like, uh, microaggressions or any form of like micro movements of other people, whether in a cycling crit race or on the field in football? Uh, I wouldn't call it a formal study. But it's like, it's like one of those things where you, you're around it enough and you can kind of read like, like, yeah, like people's body language and kind of just uh, get a feel for what they're about to do, right? Sometimes I'll get in a position and, or do scout team looks and imitate my opponent. And sometimes like I have to like bend my knee a little certain way before I can go a certain direction or I, I have to like kind of lean or shift my weight a certain direction before I have to, you know, move a certain direction. So it's like, if I were to be the person in front of me, how would my body move? Or how would I want my body to be positioned before I make a certain move? And again, that mixed with watching them, um, you know, play as they play, you know, you, you get the experience over time to kind of just catch, you know, certain things. You can kind of tell... You know, in football, we have a play, uh, you know, you can call it a counter or like a you know, power, like a power or something like that. We'll have a guard pull. And a pull is when he doesn't block you in front of him. He kind of just pulls away and um, goes behind the whole line of scrimmage and blocks another guy on the end of the formation. And for that to happen, he kind of has to lighten his, his hand up a little bit. He kind of leans back and we call that like a Buddha stance where he's like kind of on his heels. He's trying to like prepare himself to move backwards instead of forwards. So it's just um, just little things that you gain knowledge on over time. Yeah, and I think, I think with cycling, um, you know, in races, um, usually it's, it's, it's fast paced. You gotta, you know, stay 100% focused all the time. Um, for me personally, I'm pretty much constantly scanning what's going on around me, both to my side and what's going on right in front of me and even up the road like if there's a move going up the road or if there's another group up the road like I'm constantly like looking around just being aware of what's going on um 
it's the same like that in every discipline of cycling, I would say, you know, especially on the track, you know, riding with other people, especially in the team pursuit, like you have to be super aware of what's going on around you. You know, you're literally like inches or less away from your teammates wheel in front of you. So if somebody makes a move or makes a mistake, then, you know, that could mean a crash. It can mean multiple people crashing. You never know. So for that reason, yeah, you have to be constantly scanning what's going on on around you. Um, and, you know, even if it's, you know, studying what other people are doing in other races. So, like, I love watching other races that are going on. Um, I love watching replays of our races just so I can get a better understanding of how the people were riding around me, both behind me and around me. So, yeah, I mean, definitely studying, always, always watching races, always learning. I can always learn more. Um, yeah. Love that growth mindset from both of you. Um, I do want to switch gears for a little bit because we only have a few minutes left. Uh, so I know that both of you are very proud Native American and First Nations people. First Nations, for those of you who aren't aware, um, it's a preferred term in Canada um, for Native American people, First Nations. And the two of you have co-founded the Dreamcatcher Foundation focused on empowering youth through sports. Um, and so question for the two of you, what inspired you to create the Dreamcatcher Foundation? Yeah, so yeah, so this foundation we started a few years ago, um, back in 2018, with the help of an organization called Athletes and Causes. Um, you know, with both Ely and I, Ely being a member of the Doki's First Nation of the Ojibwe Nation, and myself being Oneida, um, part of the Oneida Nation, and both of us being professional athletes as well, we both just feel such a strong inclination to give back to Native communities particularly Native youth in any way possible. And we both just felt that the best way to do that would be through creating this foundation and doing nonprofit work through this foundation. Um, so as you said, basically our, our foundation aims to empower Native youth through sports, such as football and cycling. Um, also, we aim to provide um, sports equipment, such as cycling, uh, bikes and helmets, and then camps as well. So we hosted our first football camp a few years ago back in Ely's hometown of Ottawa, which was a major success. And then we just recently, over the last couple of days, had a major bike distribution or also called a bike rodeo where we went out to the uh, Cataragas and Allegheny um, reservations, which are part of the Seneca Nation and distributed over 100 bikes to the, the native youth in those areas. Um, we talked about bike safety, um, we went on a ride in the parking lot through a little obstacle course, um, with the kids, which was super fun. So yeah, that's, that's one side of the foundation. And then the other side of the foundation, um, basically aims to highlight the crisis of the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls pandemic happening in North America, which is something that most people have never heard of. People have no idea this is even happening within our own country as well as Canada. And so that's the other part of our foundation because we just both feel like it's something that needs to be known and that not many people actually know about. It's, it's not just, uh, again, we're on the topic of data and quantifiable, you know, it it's our quantifiable information. It's, it's, it's not necessarily just the, you know, the number of, you know, for us, we just did the bike rodeo. It's not about the number of bikes or, you know, how many dollars you can raise for a fundraiser. I feel like it's it's much deeper than that. It's about sending a message to, you know, the kids and that community that like we're all in this together. And as as much as much as there's, you know, bad stuff happening in the world, I mean, you know, you can turn on the TV and, and readily there's gonna be something in front of you that's just really bad. And it's just letting people know that we're in this together and you know, we, we have to band together to to advance ourselves. And so for me and Shayna, you know, for us, it was being able to see the smiles on, on these kids' faces, you know, getting a bike or just getting it to ride. Or for her, like, they were seeing her and her kit, her, her pro kit. Like, you just think about how huge that is. And just being able to simply ride your bike with them or, uh, you know, teaching someone how to ride their bike. It's just a very simple act that could potentially have an effect years down the road. I mean, you could inspire one of these children to – to do something great and and they themselves want to do something for their community or for someone else. And that, I think that's the beauty of it is as people, there's far more than just 
numbers all around us or strict information that follows a specific path is it's that unpredictability that we have ingrained in ourselves that I think is also, you know, something that we can use and, and potentially help each other uh, with. So, um, so yeah. far this nonprofit work has been amazing. And for the both of us, it doesn't really feel like work. You know, we, we love, we love doing this, you know, we love being able to, to, to do this with, with everyone. And, you know, we enjoy sports so much that, you know, it just doesn't feel like it's much of an effort. We kind of just do it because we want to and, mm -hmm. you know, and we love it. Um, yeah. And, you know, this is something that's small as of right now, but or relatively small, but you never know the impact you're going to have on someone's life down the road. And that's something that we're striving to address, you know, every time we do something like this or we do a camp or, you know, you just simply interacting with someone, you know. Um, it could inspire them to do something. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's pretty much uh, our gig right now. And we're loving it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's something we started back in 2018 when we were kind of like new to the whole, you know, pro sports uh, world, you know, and and uh, it's something we do intend on, on keeping on doing uh, down the road. Yeah, and we will have many more camps and fundraisers in the future. So this is just the beginning, really. I feel like we're still just getting started. I love that you two are both able to combine your passion and giving back to your community. So it doesn't, it comes across that you two are loving this. And I would love to get to know how can our listeners help contribute to this cause as well? I mean, feel free to follow us on our social media. We have our foundation's um, Instagram page. Um, just, I think it's, I can't remember the exact handle, but it's at Dreamcatcher Foundation, FDN at the end. Um, with like a couple underscores here and there. But if you just type in the Dreamcatcher Foundation on Instagram, it should pop up. We also have a Facebook page. Um, so people, and a website actually that we just launched last year. Yeah. And, you know, if people can just, um, you know, follow us on social media, stay updated on what we're doing um, and potentially even help support our fundraising in the future, that would mean the world to us. Um, but even if it's just something as simple as sharing posts that we share on social media to help us spread the word about what we're doing, um, that itself really can go a long way. Um, yeah. We think that uh, obviously knowledge is one of the biggest wealths you can acquire. And, you know, for us, it's being able to share that knowledge, share the statistics on, on the happenings uh, in our community. So something even as simple as learning a little bit more about the issues that, you know, we talk about is huge. And, you know, you don't have to fork over, you know, it, obviously we'd love to be able to, to raise more money for these communities. But again, to us, it all even starts with just understanding each other. And I think that's where the root um, really stems from for, for our, our path as, as a world, as people to understand one another is, is knowing about more. Uh, knowing about each other a little bit more. And speaking of learning and stats, uh, Shana, you had mentioned that the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls pandemic, many Americans don't know about it. Could you share a few stats about that? Yeah, so the statistics surrounding it are actually pretty, pretty depressing. Um, so Native American women are actually murdered at a rate 10 times higher than the national average, um, according to the Department of Justice. And some other statistics include, I think it's Native women, or three out of four Native women experience domestic violence, or just violence in general at some point in their lifetime. And then homicide is actually the third leading cause of death for Native women between the ages of 10 and 24. Um, and also, um, I believe it's 40% uh, of human trafficking victims um, identify as um, Native American First Nation women. Um, so those are just a few of the, the sad statistics. Just goes to show how dire the situation is. And if you want to learn more, again, uh, we do have our website. It's uh, uh, dreamcatcherfdn.org. Um, we have all sorts of information in there, um, workshops and um, you know different various uh, statistics that are available on these issues. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you both for so much for taking that first step in helping educate people on this. If I hadn't known Shana since my days in college, I wouldn't have known that this was such an issue. But then doing further research, you realize just how far of a, of a long-standing problem this has been. It's not just a recent issue. It's been a long-standing issue. Um, so I want to 
I, n- I want to be respectful of your time since I know you both have to get back to your practices and your full-time pro careers. Um, but I want to thank you both so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us today and talk about what life as a pro athlete is like, the data that you use, and your work with the Dreamcatcher Foundation nonprofit. You thank you so much. We appreciate you having us. It was awesome. This is honestly, though, I really like the uh, speaking about data. I think that's something that not a lot of people, all the interviews we've ever, or interviews or conversations we've ever done, you know, I, I don't think we've ever had that angle, and I think it's really refreshing. So mm-hmm. I, I think agree. I think that's awesome. Um, again, um, if you ever feel like hitting us up, just want to talk about whatever else, we're always open to uh, have more conversations. And you can find both of them on Instagram at Shayna Palace and at Gravity Train, right? Yep. Yes.